Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies. Salam alaikum. My name is Richard Thompson. I am the editorial director of Mead, the Middle East Economic Digest, and I'm absolutely delighted to be invited to moderate this prestigious panel, and thank you for having me. Um, over the past four decades, the UAE has become known all around the world for its ability to deliver landmark, world-class, world-scale projects, such as the Burj Khalifa, Etihad Rail, Dubai Metro, Baruj, Yas Island, Dubai International Airport. The list goes on and on. Uh, with a pipeline of future projects of, we estimate at Mead, about $630 billion of projects that we know about in the UAE, there is no question that this um, trajectory for the UAE is going to continue for decades. Um, but while mega projects will continue to be central to achieving the UAE vision, um, the nature of these projects is changing. And so too is the way that we are delivering projects. The UAE projects market um, is, has been and is being driven by the need to meet the expectations of a fast-growing young population and a rapidly expanding economy. Population growth, maximizing hydrocarbons value, and the drive to diversify will continue to underpin investment in power, water, oil, gas, transport, housing, real estate, and so on. But today, the battle against climate change and the need for energy security is reshaping the projects market. And projects such as Baraka Energy Plant, Noor Energy One, and the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Solar Park are spearheading the UAE's energy diversification and decarbonization. And these projects will be followed by many, many more. The digitalization of the economy is not only driving investment in smart cities, smart grids, and data infrastructure, it is also transforming the way that projects are designed, built, and operated. And BIM, Building Information Modeling, Digital Twins, and Cloud-Based Project Controls are providing huge opportunities to make efficiencies and to improve productivity in the way projects are delivered. But they require uh, a new way of working, a different mindset, cultural change in our projects industry, and they require collaboration. That will require new forms of contract and new models for working. And then finally, the growing role of the private sector uh, in providing skills, expertise, and of course, finance um, is, is incredibly important and significant and will reduce the state monopoly on projects through things like public-private partnerships. So today, to discuss uh, these challenges and opportunities faced by the UAE as it prepares to deliver its next generation of mega-projects and to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050, I'm delighted to introduce this incredible panel of uh, leaders in the projects industry. Um, three gentlemen who uh, will shape the projects market for many years to come. Uh, so immediately on my left, we have the UAE Minister of Energy uh, and Industry, uh, His Excellency Suhail al Mazrui. Uh, he has been the Minister of Energy since 2013. Uh, and in July 2020, the ministry grew bigger when merging, it merged with the Ministry for Infrastructure Development and the Federal Transport Authority for Land and Maritime to become the Ministry for Energy and Infrastructure. And this includes the Sheikh Zayed housing program. In the middle seat, we are uh, lucky and delighted to have the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer for Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, His Excellency Saeed Mohammed al Tayer with more than 35 years of experience in the field of, in fields of telecommunications, energy, water, infrastructure, oil, gas, and industry. Uh, uh, he's been leading DIWA since 1992 and has uh, achieved unprecedented successes and has become one of the very, uh, made DIWA one of the very uh, best, most distinguished utilities in the world. Uh, in 2016, the United Nations Development Programme appointed His Excellency as the UNDP National Goodwill Ambassador for Sustainable Development Goals. 
And at the far end of the panel, we have the Chief Executive Officer of Etihad Rail Company, Engineer Shadi Malak. Um, with two decades of experience, Engineer Malak is a leading figure in the UAE transportation industry, and he has been at the helm of Etihad Rail, the national railway uh, in the UAE since 2018. He had previously worked as Chief Executive Officer uh, for Etihad Rail DB, the operating partner of Etihad Rail, uh, and Engineer Malak led stage two of the Etihad Rail project through awarding contracts worth close to $5 billion, which started construction in January 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panelists. <laughs> so, um, Your Excellency uh, Suhail al mujroui as the Minister for Energy and Infrastructure, can you please tell us about the mega projects that UAE is currently working on in the fields of energy and infrastructure? Thank you, and it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to, uh, to be among this distinguished panel. And I would like to thank His Excellency Matar Tair for convening this uh, international uh, event where we are discussing mega scale projects. But let me take one step back. In order to implement a mega projects and be successful in doing so, you have to have a plan, a long term plan. We're, we, are, we are blessed in this country with a leadership that wants to stretch the limit when it comes to planning. So when we say we would like to plan for 20 years, they push it to 30. And when we say 30, they would push it to 50 years. And the latest plan I was asked to do was taking us to 2,120. I will, not, uh, I will not tell you which one because that's something in the pipeline. But that's, that's the nature. So this is a 100-year plan. That's a 100 years plan. So wow. that's, that's the nature of how we think. And I think that's one that would attribute to our success in planning. The other thing that, we, that, that also helped us is we don't look at things in silo. We, see, we saw in the opening statement a speech by, uh, by His, His Highness, uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, our Prime Minister, uh, and His Highness was saying, we don't work in silos. We, you think it's in silos when you see large-scale projects, but this is part of a bigger plan that the leadership has been working on. So from that, that took us to an energy to plan for, back in 2017, a bottom-up approach planning for 2050. Before even COP talk about the targets of 2050, UAE back in 2016 or 15 started working on a plan for 2050. And that plan, sustainability was one pillar of it. And that plan since we started have managed large scale projects that I'm sure His Excellency Saeed al tayyar will tell you a bit uh, on, on solar and hydrogen and others. But the impact we have done internationally through large-scale projects in energy, we managed to reduce the cost of solar and beat ourselves every year in, that, in that, that number from, I would say, up to 25 to 30 cent to now 1.35 cent per kilowatt hour. No one have done that. No. And I don't think we could have done it without large-scale projects. So solar, we are going to spend more. We are going to develop much more projects. We are targeting to spend in a mega scale projects in the energy to transform us to the 2050. We will spend $161 billion or 600 billion dirhams. And there is a story behind that number. When we looked at the initial phase of planning myself, and Saeed and others in the, in the, in the UAE, we came up with a, with a number just going with gas, without sustainability, just going fossil alone, and the number was $353 billion, or 1.3 trillion dirhams. That would be the energy bill, capex and opex. And then we start working together, and then we managed together to come up with the energy strategy for the country, 
which is going to save us 700 billion dirhams or 190 plus billion dollars. So you, you started from the bottom up, you put together a 300 and, um, 350 billion dollar plan initially between now and 2050. You've then engineered it and you've, you've come up with a 161 billion dollar program and that's the national program for project investment over the next 30, 30 yes, years. Yes, and part of those large projects will come. So around 44 gigawatt at least of solar projects, and we are going to see them here in the UAE. Uh, if I could just um, bring in uh, His Excellency uh, Saeed al Tire. So you, you talked, Minister, on solar projects there. Perhaps, um, Your Excellency, if you could dig into a little bit of detail about the, the plans for energy projects uh, that you can see in Dubai specifically. Thank you very much. Uh, you see, uh, before that, I think I need to elaborate. Uh, we made a decision last year. We made two decisions. To stop gas turbine for future project. Second thing, to stop desalination plant also for future project. Why? Yes, Jabal Ali, for example, right now is the best plant in the world in terms of efficiency. Mm -hmm. We have nearly about 90% efficiency in Jabal Ali. However, in the winter, the efficiency is decreases in the water side. Why? Because during the year, especially summer period, the peak is there and we can benefit from the waste heat because more gas turbines are in operation. But in the summer, we have to shut down these gas turbines and we have to operate the axial boiler. Axial boiler are more expensive. Then we decided not only to have a clean power, but also to have clean water also. The model that we are using as his Excellency mentioned, the IBB project, independent power plant, and for the water also, IWB project. Now, so independent this means water projects. Definitely. This means that our CAPEX in the future will be only on the distribution and transmission. Most of the investment, what we're going to do, only to invest 10 to 10 percent. The other become by the independent uh, power or IWB. Second thing is that we're talking about the efficiency. It's very important. So we will have RO plant connected to green energy. Uh, if you want me to speak about the mega project, we have the largest single site worldwide. Mohammed Bar Rashid uh, uh, project is about 5,000 megawatt. And uh, presently, actually, we have now, right now, in Dubai, we have about 11.5 energy connected to the grid. And we're supposed to have 7%. What does it mean? This it means that we have an excellent strategy plan. We are above the curve. And we're going to accelerate our programs and our project. Also, I think efficiency is very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, we are putting solar, we are putting in the future green hydrogen, and also we have the hydro station in Hatta. But I think we have to look at the efficiency. In the beginning, the efficiency, especially five years ago, it's not there. Solar, you have to put the BV and should be fixed only. Well, maybe perhaps if I can come back to efficiency in, in just a moment, yeah. I'd like to bring in Engineer Malik uh, to, for some opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for those comments. Engineer Malik, you are responsible for one of the UAE's biggest strategic projects, the Etihad Rail, the National Railway. Can you tell us about the, you know, the status and the strategic objectives of that project? Sure. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers and the RTA and His Excellency Matar al -Tayr for giving us the platform to talk about the Tehad Rail. It's a true honor to be in such a panel with His Excellency the Minister of Transport and His Excellency Saeed al -Tayr. Tehad Rail is a mega project. It's a mega program that connects 
most cities or all cities of the UAE from border to border, from the Saudi border to the east coast of the UAE on the coastal towns of Fujairah and Khorfakan. And it is intended to uh, provide a solution that uh, integrates most of our industrial zones, ports, and industries together to transform this into one big uh, economy of scale that serves the entire nation and the entire country of the UAE. Uh, we do uh, envisage that rail, like in any part of the world, not only in the UAE, in the US, in Europe, in China, and uh, in every country, it has played a transformational role by cat catalyzing growth and uh, energizing the economy and diversifying it. So Tahar Rail will play that part. You can imagine by connecting the Jabal Ali Free Zone to Abu Dhabi Free Zone to Raqqa's Free Zone, Ras Al Khaimah, what, uh, how you could uh, support the industrialization and the economic agenda of the government, such as Operation 300, making the UAE. Uh, because uh, the railway will connect all these zones, will connect the suppliers from each emirate to the end user. We will also definitely support the net zero emission uh, agenda of the UE, and we'll talk about that later, I understand. We also will support the tourism. When we launched the passenger towards the end of last year, uh, it's a subject that's very close to my heart. <coughs> Most visitors to the UAE, most residents to the UAE, they know very well the major cities and hubs of the UAE, such as Abu Dhabi and Dubai Emirate. But as a person who's been working for 20 years or 15 years on the railway, there is a lot the UAE can offer. And right now we're celebrating the winter, zone, uh, winter uh, season. If you go to the western region of Abu Dhabi, towns such as Al-Marfa, Liwa, uh, Sela will be connected by the railway to the hubs of Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Towns in the northern regions, such as beautiful towns, such as Al-Bathna, Al-Dhaid, Falaj al and areas within Abu Dhabi and Dubai, such as Al-Wathba and Al-Awir, they will all be connected by the railway, and it will provide any tourist, any visitor to this country, the opportunity to have a safe, reliable, efficient mode of transport that's uh, as well uh, economically can purchase the tickets and move from one part to another part. And this is something that the railway will bring to the UE economy. It's, it's very interesting. The three of you have mentioned in different forms efficiency. So integration is efficiency. Uh, um, Your Excellency mentioned efficiency in the energy sector. And you talked about strategic planning, joined up thinking. It's clearly the this focus on efficiency and, and connection between the different parts. Um, Minister, if I can come back to you, I'd like to move on to energy transition, so it, it follows on from what we've just been talking about. Um, in terms of the 2050 net zero ambition, so you've outlined the capital program between now and 2050. How far down the line are we towards the net zero targets, carbon emissions targets, and what needs to be done, particularly with regards to renewables? What enabled us uh, to, to commit to be the first country to commit uh, net zero by 2050 uh, in the region is the fact that we worked, probably our leadership have thought about this 15, 20 years. That's when start, we start thinking about the nuclear power plants. The four, just to give you a perspective, the four nuclear power plants, once they are fully operational, they will be removing around more than 22 million ton annually of CO2. And that, what does that mean to many of us who are not uh, into, into the... Uh, this is like removing 4.8 million cars from the streets. So you could imagine wow. uh, the, 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 the influence. Now uh, we have one of the plants uh, on stream commercially, the second plant hopefully by the first quarter and the other two will follow. And, and, and so we are already doing the plan and, and contributing to that plan. Uh, His Excellency Saeed mentioned the Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid uh, project, and we have a couple of projects already uh, either finished or, or under uh, construction in Abu Dhabi, totaling more than 3,000 uh, 3, megawatt of, uh, of, uh, of solar. And the plans move on. So we have a plan, but part of that plan, and I think that's very important, is working on efficiency, 
we would be, prob if not the most efficient in the world, among the most efficient in the world in everything with that, that we are doing. We are also would like to lead the region and convincing the people here in the UAE to consume less. Our target is to consume less by 40% by the year 2050. And that's very important. So we need to change the building codes, and we're responsible for infrastructure, to build the building codes, to start using artificial intelligence in ensuring that the buildings will be smart to smoothen the curve. And move from a smart house to a smart grid and then to a smart city. And is, is that why the energy ministry and the infrastructure ministry have been brought together? Because the consumption part of the energy story needs to be connected with the production part. Exactly. So that even that thinking on, on regulation have been there in our leadership. They pushed the envelope. Why don't we do this? And by the way, you will not find this common around the world. You no. will not. I tend to go and meet probably three ministers. <laughs> Minister of Transportation, Minister of Energy, and sometimes the Minister of Infrastructure or, or, or National Housing. But we are trying to put all of these things together to prove to the world that if you plan on that scale, you can achieve and you can, you can lead. And that's, I think, I mean, if you ask me what's so different here is that thinking that is driven by the leadership and that thinking that makes us work without the silos. We remove the silos. We look at the bigger picture and how can we achieve it in transportation? How can we achieve it in, uh, in, uh, in energy? And how can we also, one of the challenges is water. <laughs> Many people, they don't know. Today in the Emirates, we are consuming 60% of the water that we consume every day. It comes from Earth, from the, from, from the aquifer. And oh, really? that's scary. That's scary. That's why we will be, we, we, uh, we announced an initiative recently to give the farmers option, to give them desalinated water, to stop this and, and, and protect our, our aquifers. So even that planning for protecting the water and, and, and trying to give alternatives, linking that with also the food security. But perhaps if I can, on the topic of water, if I can move across to His Excellency Saeed al -Tair. So you talked about efficiency and you mentioned uh, desalination and water. Um, so where, wh you know, Dubai has, and Diwa have done incredibly well over the past two decades uh, under your leadership in, in solar, in reverse osmosis. How far do you think you have come towards net zero and what still needs to be done? Where are your priority areas? Is water the priority? Okay, let me first elaborate about the efficiency. I will tell you, Jab uh, Jabal Ali uh, power plant, it used to be 30% efficiency. Today, most three of the big, the biggest plant in the world, I mean, in the, in the Jabal Ali, which is the biggest as number of turbine that we're having. Efficiency raised to 90%. How right. we done this? We done this through combined cycle, back pressure turbine. We'll able, as I mentioned, in the summer to utilize all the waste heat, and it's a fuel free. So we will able to produce more megawatt. Second thing regarding the solar solar technology, there is on a yearly basis a lot of innovation. When when we started with the pilot project, it was fixed. Just the BV panel is fixed. And, and nowadays, we have different technology. Mm -hmm. And the efficiency at that time, it's about 10%. Today, the efficiency reached 24%. How is that? Because the technology is different. Now, you, have, you can move movable panel where it can follow the sun. Second thing. By a fascia also, underneath the panel, you can produce nearly 5%. So the efficiency is there. But I think there are challenges about the uh, solar, which is the storage. Because all the BV panels, you can benefit average only maximum about four hours. In the early morning, you will not get sufficient radiance. 
also after four o'clock you will not get sufficient. So what we have done in Dubai, we have the largest uh, single site beside the site, CSP project, two type of technology. We have the tower technology, we are using molten salt technology, and second thing, we have the largest also parabolic technology. So we can store uh, for the uh, cooling for about uh, 15 hours. So this will be help us at night. Otherwise, I will end up uh, generating more conventional type gas turbine. By the way, gas turbine can live in the next 40 years. We cannot retire them because you, we put a lot of investment in them. Now, how can we, how we reach to 050? We have a plan, we have a strategic plan and we are, uh, you know, review our plan on a yearly basis and we have to ensure that always we are above the curve and we have KPIs for, for each segment of it. Therefore, so far we are above the curve, by the way, even that the reduction in, in uh, SOX and, and also in uh, CO2 level. We have a target also, we have a, a roadmap. We suppose to reduce uh, CO2 about 90% by 2019. However, we, we sorry, 22, uh, 19%. Uh, However, we reduce 30% in 2020. Mm -hmm. But I think also there are other issues. The building itself, as His Excellency mentioned, we in Dubai we have about 100,000 buildings. We started with 30,000 buildings mm -hmm. and we done a retrofit. It's very important to improve the efficiency by 40% for each building. Now, this exercise going on, and I think, I think according to the plan, we can achieve zero, uh, zero emission by 2050. Very good. It's very interesting to hear the, this um, coming together of energy, infrastructure, housing, building. It's all uh, becoming close, more closely linked. And if I can move to the transport side, engineer uh, Malak. So how will um, Etihad Rail contribute to net zero by 2050. Is, is this about getting cars off the road or is it about efficiency and electricity generation? Well, it's massive. <laughs> Tehad Rail is intrinsic with environmental sustainability and with, with, with efficiency in terms of uh, utilization of energy. So I won't take much of your time, but you know, you just think about it. It's one train load which can take 400 people, could replace anywhere between 200 and 400 cars, one train load which can remove 300 trucks from the road and those trucks or, or cars in a hard rail uh, context, these are long distance trips that could be emitting a lot of CO2. So it's hard rail will contribute significantly and it will be a major tool in reducing carbon emissions because railways by their nature, by default, by their making, they are the most efficient mode of transport in terms of energy utilization and, and, and emissions. And transport sector across the globe is contributing anywhere in each, depends on the country, between 18% to 64% in certain counts mm -hmm. of emissions in that country. So to have rail and the railway program that was announced towards the end of uh, last year alongside the local metros and tramways and other public transport will play a key role in achieving this agenda. Thank you very much. I'd love to get into some detail about the technical challenge of the railway project as well because it's such a vast program. But uh, thank you. Maybe that's for another panel. Uh, Minister, if I can come back to you then, I'd like to ask you about the kind of the vision and your priorities in the vision. So um, where do you see your ministry or the UAE, 50 years, 100 years, you, you talked about the 100-year strategy, where, where do you see and what are the key projects in your kind of vision uh, that are going to help us get to that point? Let me first hope that I will not be pushed to a 100 years plan because, <laughs> <laughs> because well, I you said it. <laughs> That's, that's something on the, the, that we have done, but it was not an official, an official uh, plan. But 
what we are trying to do, we're trying to uh, be a responsible uh, producer and influencer in the world. For us as UAE, don't forget that we are also many countries that relies on us on hydrocarbon. So the fossil, when it comes to fossil fuel, we have also an obligation to the world to supply the transition. So we need also, and we have a plan together with our friends in OPEC Plus led by Saudi Arabia. And uh, we have a plan as a suppliers to continue investing to ensure that we don't have a disruption during the or, or a high price environment during the transition. Second, we are going to update our plans on every five years. So this year we are going to update the, five, the 2050 energy strategy. Maybe we'll change it, depends on, on the prices. We all know that what happened to the commodities, both gas and, and coal in terms of commodity prices in 2020, in 2021, sorry. Uh, the jump, the huge uh, spike in, in prices will lead us to think and look at the future. Hydrogen, we have a plan for hydrogen. Mm -hmm. we, we, and, and we were the first country to regulate hydrogen cell cars in the country. And we, uh, as part of, of our commitment to, toward COP26, uh, we put a leadership roadmap toward hydrogen. And uh, we're working now on a plan with the DIWA and others and all of the different sectors to come up for a plan for hydrogen uh, and a strategy for hydrogen. But we are intending to export hydrogen and we are targeting a 25 market share, 25% market share in the future. Oh really? If this is for hydrogen across the board or green hydrogen? or Hydrogen, I would say across the board. Blue, green. Blue and yeah. green. Uh, because because uh, until we get green to a commercially attractive levels, it's going to be a challenge. But this is, this is a $400 billion market by the year 2050. And you we, want 25% we of would, that? We would grab a share and, and we are putting plans. So everything we do is we're targeting to be environmentally uh, concerned uh, uh, country when it comes to our commitment. At the same time, we are a reliable supplier and we will continue doing that. But guess what? We're not just leaving, we're not just going to produce hydrocarbon and, and uh, do emissions and say life is like that. We're pushing the envelope as well there to produce the cleanest barrel in planet Earth. And we, uh, we have seen that our national oil company have shifted all of their energy to, uh, to, uh, to, to green and clean energy, both coming from nuclear plants and, and coming from, from uh, solar power plants. So we are also pushing, pushing the efficiency envelope even to, to the national oil company. All of these plans tells you that we will have a very uh, structured strategies in the future. And we think those are going to lead the region for other countries as well to do it. I will leave you with, with the final note. We are also working in more than 30 countries around the world, positively influencing the implementation of solar energy. We are investing in more than 30 projects and our plan or, or our current, uh, our current uh, installed capacity worldwide is around 23 gigawatt. We are going to 200 gigawatt in the future. So that's a very aggressive plan from a country that mm. produces hydrocarbon. That's on solar, wind, and, and hydrogen and across. So you're moving from being, the UAE is moving from being an oil supplier to being an energy leader. Green energy I, leader. I see it. But, uh, um, Your Excellency Saeed al Tayer. so if we, can, if we can ask the same question about DIWA, your key projects looking forward, but particularly following on, on the minister's point about hydrogen. So DIWA is we're running a pilot project and I'm interested about th the story you told about the cost reduction and the technology development on the solar side. I guess on green hydrogen, we're just at the start of that same journey. Yeah. 
Uh, actually, the same thing like the solar initially. We started to do the pilot project and we study the bronze and cons and then we move from there. Uh, but there are challenges with hydrogen presently. Um, hydrogen is very expensive right now. If you tell me how you see it in the future, I will see, yes, hydrogen will be the future. And especially Dubai, we don't have oil. We, uh, we're talking about green hydrogen. And, and I think uh, there will be, um, we already uh, awarded, a, uh, I mean, an cons international consultant to put a roadmap for the next uh, 50 years. And uh, I will see hydrogen after 10 years, maybe the prices per kilowatt will come down. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, we, we already implemented 300 kilowatts, about 50 million, which is very expensive. And maybe hydrogen will come first in mobility, in buses. Uh, but in the industry and in the commercial and residential, I think it will come later, but not soon. We'll need, we need time, but there is no problem. I think we are we're having a pilot project. Maybe in the future more innovation is coming, and therefore we can scale it up. But uh, hydrogen, I think it's a promising. Besides hydrogen, we have the hydro from uh, uh, Hatta. We will have about 250 megawatt within, 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 within 80 seconds. And uh, the life of the plant is 80 years. Uh, and also, beside that, uh, we are studying the batteries also. Mm -hmm. uh, we are studying uh, lithium ion, and also we are studying uh, sodium silver. Uh, and these are very expensive, actually. Mm -hmm. We will look at the unit cost, generated cost, is very expensive. And but when, when but you sorry to interrupt. Yeah. When, when you say you were studying Battery so I have a pilot project. When, is this when with I universities or with industry? No, no. It is in um, Mohammed bin Rashid Solar Park. Right. We have a pilot. We are monitoring the performance. But we have to look at the cost. Honestly speaking, at, if it is not cost effective, I will not proceed for it. Because uh, it's very important. Uh, and, uh, but we need some time. So far, we look at the generated unit cost. Yeah. If it is, and, and we didn't mark now uh, with the competitive from solar. So, so I think solar will penetrate the market so fast. So you talk, you've been talking about the unit cost for production, I guess. Definitely, yeah. Distribution. I mean, I mean now in Dubai, if you, if you compare unit cost, uh, there are three types, I mean, the gas turbine unit cost is about over 10 cents, 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And you look about the lowest stabilized cost in Dubai we obtain, about 1.6. This is the difference. But this is not the storage. Storage cost is higher, about 7, uh, seven cents per kilowatt. So cost is very important. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, Engineer Shadi, um, same question really about Etihad Rail. Looking forward, you know, in December you announced the, um, the passenger rail plans. What, what are the, the next stages of Etihad Rail? What are the key projects and any big announcements? Well, I think, first of all, let's uh, quickly review what has been achieved in such a short period of time. I mean, January 2020, His Highness Sheikh Diab bin Mohammed launched the construction of Etihad Rail and it's documented in the media in February 2020, COVID broke out across the globe where many projects got derailed, the Tahad Rail project, thanks to the wise decisions of the leadership of the UAE during the pandemic and before the pandemic, because many people forget that before the pandemic, we had, as His Excellency Suhail said, a big push from the government towards digitalization. That enabled us at the railway level and at construction level to maintain our design capability, especially while dealing with so many contractors from across the globe, spanning from Milan to China. So we announced at the end of last year that 70% of the project has been completed. Despite it has one of the most challenging attributes, we're working tunneling through the mountains of the north. We're doing marine bridges in the waters of Abu Dhabi Ports Company and Kizad. 
We're building through Sabkhaz, through desert dunes. We still completed package 2A two months ahead of time. We still completed all our tunnels to the north, something that stood for too long as a huge barrier and intimidation to all the engineers and construction people that are trying to build to the east coast of the UE. That also has been completed. As I said, 70% has been completed. And the announcement of uh, launching passenger trains, which I think was long anticipated and the number one question on our social media platforms, is are we going to have passengers? And we've answered this towards the end of last year through a wise decision from the leadership of the UAE that yes, you will have passenger running on those railway tracks. So those railway tracks are a reality right now. Without revealing too much detail, you can spot them in so many parts of uh, the country and railway has become a reality. And this is a call to all uh, transport companies, all end users to start getting ready for a new transport era, era across the UAE, utilizing a safe, reliable, cheap mode of transport that's environmentally friendly. I, and I, I was interested in the announcement in December about the, the passenger network. Yeah. There was the, th the three parts of it. The third part was about integrated transport with absolutely. You light cannot, rail you things. cannot, you cannot have a passenger network or a freight network without integrating with the other modes of transport and without having a proper first and last mile. The question is not only about a journey time from one city to another, how long it takes, but once you get there. So part of the National Way program that was announced is, first of all, to connect with existing metros, such as Dubai Metro, and secondly, is if required, is to launch our own plans of tramways and metros within local cities to serve the overall. Plus other modes of transport, such as uh, autonomous vehicles, the uh, mode sharing vehicles, mm. all other entities that complete the journey and do it in a UE style, where comfort, quality, is not negotiable for Texas residents and visitors. Takes us back to the theme that the minister started with, this of idea of a strategic big picture to, to fill out the parts. Okay, we have three minutes remaining. I want to start at the far end and finish up with the minister. One minute for each of you. We have a room full of people who are responsible for delivering projects. What advice would you give to these project leaders um, on how to think about delivering projects? What, you know, the, to deliver efficiency or you know, cost savings? If, uh, well, 30 really second difficult answers. difficult for me to talk about this in the presence of His Excellency, the minister. He is the role model in leadership, but um, His Excellency Matar Attar is sitting here. He's a person I've known for 15 years. He's my mentor. And if I borrow his words, he's always stressed to me the importance of respecting everyone. This is the end of modesty, of humbleness, of respecting your subordinates, your superiors, your peers, your suppliers, and your contractors. He's also stressed for me the importance of planning. You don't plan to fail, but people plan, fail to plan. And he's stressed uh, tolerance and acceptance, and those are his words. Okay, so mine. respect, planning, and tolerance. That's your three yep. key words. Thank you. Your Excellency Saeed al Tai. what advice would you pass on to the future project people? It depends if you're talking about execution, it is different than if you're talking about planning. If, you, if you're talking about execution, you have to select the right project manager. The leadership is very important. I mean, uh, second, the teamwork. They should work in harmony. It's a teamwork, it's not individual because, you know, it consists of finance, mm -hmm. management, mm -hmm. uh, people. Uh, the third thing, I think I always insist on delivery in time. It's very important. I mean, so hitting there, the there, there, are, there are three elements to the project. Time, uh, cost, control cost also is very important. Quality. And quality. Okay, so um, leadership, teamwork, and then the three KPIs, time, yeah. cost, and quality. Yeah. Minister, if I can just bring you uh, for some closing words on this, you know, what, what top-down advice would you pass on to this audience about these delivering these mega projects? I think I'll add to, to, to what they mentioned because all of those are, are critical elements for, for mega projects implementation. 
what I will add is sustainability. You need to think of the future. You are designing a project that is going to be probably a large scale project lives for 20, 30, 40 years and sometimes 60 years. So you need to think of the future generation who are going to come. And one element that we have used in our strategy is achieving inhabitant happiness. Is your project going to do that? So that's the question. Fantastic. That's bang on time. Thank you very much to all three of you. That's part of being on time. <laughs> <laughs> but the on time delivery, fantastic leadership and teamwork. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a, a, a fantastic discussion. We've not had nearly enough time. Uh, the, uh, the UAE Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, His Excellency Suhail Al Mazrui, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer for Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, His Excellency Saeed Mohammed Al Tayer, and Etihad Rail Company Chief Executive Officer, Engineer Shadi Malik. Thank you very much for your time. Please thank, thank you. your panelists. Well done, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you.